Greetings and welcome to day two of the Hearthstone Championship Tour EU Spring Preliminary. My name is Frodan, and all this weekend we've been casting the great matches that's been happening as 150 players have gathered, and we're going to grab the top eight for the Spring Championships in just over a month. Now, normally we start on the desk, and we've been talking about how the format works, but let's go ahead and introduce it, and then talk about the Blackboard of Predictions with my esteemed colleagues. So for anybody who's not been able to tune into the championship tour just yet, let's go ahead and explain the format. We've had, like we said, 150 players gathered from locations all over Europe to battle out to see who is going to be the top eight players. Uh, we put them in double elimination bracket. And so far, it's been a pretty good journey, Rob. Yeah, uh, every player for the Hearthstone Championship Tour format is allowed to ban one deck. Everyone brings four decks. Uh, we have eight matches to show today. and. Uh, these are big, impactful matches because everyone who wins on the matches we're going to be showing is going to the Europe Spring Championship, so a lot on the line here. That's right. Uh, we're going to be doing four from the upper bracket and four from the lower bracket to show who will be going through the process. We want to make sure that every person that goes through to the championship we're familiar with their their face, excuse me, they're not their face, uh, <laughs> as well as being able to get to know their decks because we have some really interesting lineups this weekend. We'll talk more about it as we get into it, but before the show actually began, we also had an opportunity to sit down with the casters and draft through who they thought would be going to the top eight. And so far, uh, the people here have been doing pretty good. Uh, let's let's go start with you, Frank. You're feeling pretty good in Tice. You feel like he's going to go all the way today? I'm hoping so. I mean, we, we're going to see Tice a little later today. Actually, he's going to be playing a match uh, that we're going to be covering, so uh, hopefully he'll keep the winning streak alive. And I, I still got some fuel left in the fire, it looks yeah. like. That's right, you do. I mean, Tice is a really good candidate, and a lot of people are cheering for him. Uh, Kibler actually had really good picks. You had Stan Sivka and Colento. Uh, however, they did have an awkward scenario last night, correct? Yeah, it's true. Uh, Stan and Colento actually played against each other, and, and Stan was the one who came out on top in that matchup. So, unfortunately, Colento was eliminated. But I, I feel like, you know, with one of my picks eliminating the other, it can't be too bad. That's right. Worth so, uh, Colento's going to be stricken off the board here. Worth noting that uh, Stan Sivka was my first pick, but then Brian got the first draft <laughs> For me, so <laughs> you, you yeah, got some just good picks anyway. You got some good picks anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. So you guys had that connection from the past. Uh, Rob, you at least look good today. I, mean, I do look really good, thank you. <laughs> you're not looking that good on the board. But uh, Blackout and Green Sheep, I mean, th these are picks that I think you were talking about that you really want to trust, uh, not just uh, you know, not just Dignitas in general, but also you've, you've been knowing them for a while. Um, but if you can go back and do it again, would you have changed your picks at all? No, sometimes, Dan, you just got to listen to your heart, despite uh, what your brain tells you. So. Gotcha. It's Plus, okay, uh, they're, they're one loss away from joining me, and, and we all float down here. So, just, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's okay. I, I think uh, overall these picks, they've been, uh, they've been doing pretty well overall. I mean, I think some of them, especially Shtano Dachi, came out of uh, left field here from Saddle, but he's still in the tournament. I think that's a really cool testament because we've been picking some names that people are familiar with. You know, as much as, like, it's like, oh, yeah, Oskaka's doing good still. I mean, come on, it's Oskaka world champion. Uh, I, feel, I feel it's much more impressive when Saddle pulls out a guy like Shtano Dachi or some people who also put their stock in guys like AK1, yeah. Um, or Faramir, who's also still in the tournament. These guys still are competing for it, and there's also people who fly under the radar constantly, like show. So I'm looking forward to see if they can do it, and uh, I don't think we should stall anymore. I think we're going to go straight into the games. We're going to have TJ, Saddle, and Raven over at the desk to bring you guys the first series of day number two. Who's going to championships? We're about to find out with our first series. Thank you very much, Dan and the boys. That's right. My name is TJ. I'm joined by Raven and Saddle, a.k.a. the full English breakfast for the cast for the first match of the Whoa. day. Uh, so much on the line today. Every single match that we watch is going to have somebody moving to the Europe Spring Championship. So, uh, first off, though, Raven, uh, how have you been enjoying the, the matches so far uh, for the preliminary? Yeah, I think the matches have been really good, actually. Um, we've had a, a nice mix of what we, uh, kind of weird to say what we see the meta decks to be, so short sure. after an expansion. Yeah. Um, but we've seen some uh, in, even interesting card choices within those decks, uh, such as like uh, Leroy in, in Midrange Warrior, which is really interesting, yeah. out of George C. And, uh, and as well, just seeing how the standard decks perform overall, and just a good idea of the meta anyway. And uh, just good matches overall. And we've got actually a nice mix of well-known sort of top-tier pros and some names that are maybe a bit lesser known, but let's be honest, they've got this far, so... Yeah, I'm just really interested in seeing all this build to a crescendo now. You know, we've seen the early chapters of the story developing in the, the opening games, but now this is really business time. All of these players, this game now to qualify for EU championships, it's the validation of three months' work, essentially, getting this to this position and putting themselves in that spot to be one of the top eight players in Europe. Yeah, last uh, season at the day two of the preliminary, people were sort of rooting for the two known players or something that were right. left in the bracket. Uh, but this time around, there's a lot more that are, that are moving forward. So uh, we saw the predictions 
Listeners, on the blackboard, you saw what we're predicting and, and who's still left in the prediction war. Uh, but let us know at home what you guys uh, are predicting or who you're predicting uh, to come out on top and make it to that spring championship. You can tweet at Play Hearthstone. Make sure you use the hashtag HCT. Or you can head over to Facebook.com slash Play Hearthstone. And just let us know, let us know your thoughts on, on the games throughout the day, uh, what decks you're, you're excited to see. I know that uh, I'm excited to see a few decks later. AK Wonder has an interesting lineup that, that's going to take place later. But uh, uh, that, that's a few matches down the road. So uh, let's start talking about the first matchup of the day. It is going to be Crane 333 versus Einer. And of course, uh, Saddle Crane is, is a, a teammate of yours. And we saw him on stream play yesterday. And, yep. and he had an impressive performance. He really did, and like people at home, if they watch a lot of Hearthstone tournaments, will be sick of people saying this and them never really <laughs> seeing it for themselves, but Crane really genuinely is one of the strongest players, has a respect from all of the established pros as being a high-level player, particularly known for his patron play, but very, very accomplished at other decks as well. So what's great to see here is him in that position where finally this can be his moment to say, hey guys, you know all that stuff you've heard about me for six months straight that I'm actually one of the best underground players that you don't know about? I'm about to prove it right now. Yeah, and I think what's really uh, interesting for me with with Crane is this is the tournament that he hasn't brought Patron Warrior, the yep. deck that he's probably most known for. And I actually think it's really good that he's just, it's, it's very difficult to not play the deck you really enjoy, but he's just identified along with his team, uh, you know, you, you JJ and such, the, the deck just isn't good enough in this mm -hmm. format at the moment. So he's not going to play it. And I think that's actually just showing that, you know, uh, even more strength from him just to say, I'm not going to play this deck I really like. I'm going to play this lineup that, you know, maybe not my favorite, but I know he's going to perform. Right, TJ, I think you did an interview with him yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. and he very, very eloquently <laughs> elaborated on why he thought Patron wasn't very good. And you could see the level of thought that he'd put into the, the heartbreaking decision <laughs> to not bring Patron Warrior to this tournament. I, I love when I ask players that are sort of uh, deck experts, like on a very specific yeah. deck, uh, questions about, you know, why their deck is strong or why their deck isn't strong, because they'll go on forever. I, <laughs> I usually ask people, usually about four or five interview questions in those interviews yeah. and try to keep them the same length. Crane, I got to ask. Like one. Yeah. <laughs> and then a follow-up question to that question because he took up all the time. So, uh, And that was because of the patron warrior question. Uh, so we, we could talk a little bit about Einar, but we don't really know much about him. Uh, so I guess we're just going to go off his lineup. I mean, he is in the upper bracket. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he has you know, won all of his matches up until this point. Uh, Raven, what do you think about his, his, his deck lineup uh, overall? Do you think uh, it'll match up well against the remaining field? Yeah, I think it's going to be okay. I mean, he's obviously got this far um, already, so he's definitely performing well. But I think a couple of interesting things in his decks, he's actually bringing aggro shame and but with an elemental destruction in as well, which is kind of interesting. We don't normally see it too often. And the Leroy and Soul Fire in Zoo for that extra burst. Yeah, we see it right there. Um, the elemental destruction, which is going to be a very big deal in this exact matchup because this is the mid-range Totem Shaman from Crane. Much more board-focused, and elemental destruction is going to have a big impact. All right, well, uh, game number one is beginning. Shaman versus Shaman. So I'm going to leave it in your hands, guys. Good luck. Have fun. Thanks, TJ. Did, did you catch that, Raven? Shaman versus Shaman? Yeah. Are, are, you, are you good on this? Yeah, the, the Shaman right. mirror. Yeah. yeah, the Shaman <laughs> mirror. Yeah. So it's going to be Aina playing the more, much more aggressive version and Crane playing the sort of totem-focused uh, board control version that normally builds up to a Bloodlust to finish the game mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Yeah, Bloodlust, Thunderbluff, Valiant. There's kind of like a bunch of little individual one-off win conditions in the deck. There's yeah. a Doomhammer, a Bloodlust, a, a Thunderbluff, Valiant. All of these things can snowball the game, but it, it's all about just building that annoying board presence with totems, using Flame Tongue Totem and, and incremental advantages from discounting Thing from below to get an advantage. But the important thing in this matchup is that you play pretty much all the same early game cards that your opponent does, so you're able to match the fast starts really effectively. Yeah, but this is what's uh, sort of interesting about Aina's deck is that he is using that elemental destruction which effectively resets the board and it's not what the mid-range shaman wants at okay. all like you want all those totems to fill up and just create that constant pressure just through hero power a lot of the time we do actually see Aina there just clearing off that tunnel trog with the rock fire which is uh the fact that he got um Finley off as well is really important. He was on the coin, so he could just uh, play them both. He puts a minion on the board, gets the Warlock hero power. So a lot of the time, Hunter is like the natural go-to because it's just a constant two, like two mana turn pressure uh, for two damage. But the Warlock one, not too shabby when you need to try and draw into that early destruction. Yeah, there's a lot of matchups where Warlock is honestly preferred. Um, I think you know if this was an aggro Shaman mirror, then Warlock is a little bit more sketchy because you kind of get into that situation where if they pick Hunter, then it doesn't match up particularly yeah. well. But when 
when it's a game about resources and it isn't going to be over quickly if you're playing against a really heavy control deck, for example, making sure you don't run out of resources is really important. That makes Life Tap uh, one of the optimal picks for sure. Yeah, and on that on that same point for for the mid range variant, it's I feel like when I play, I've played this deck uh, quite a bit since uh, you know it became very popular recently, and there's a big difference between drawing the um, oh my god, it's left my mind the the draw totem. Manatide. Manatide, wow. <laughs> I, just, I went a full blank on that one. That was pretty <laughs> crazy. But th there's a big difference between drawing Manatide and getting it off a uh, Tuscar Totemic yes. versus not drawing them at all. Because right. suddenly, like you oh, said, you, you can really fall behind on that resource. Yeah, there's there's other ways that you can make up for a, for a lack of cards in this deck. You can gain value from your totems if you draw Flame Tongue totems and yep. keep cards in your hand and just use your totems as minions to trade on the board. But yeah, definitely a, a, a deck where card draw is key and you do need to keep resources in your hand. Um, Aina here, slightly awkward position. Numbers don't quite add up the way he'd really like them to. Argent Horse Rider committed to the board on its own is not great. He'd like to use it in combination with the Abusive Sergeant. Doesn't have enough mana to do that. And so he's got a little bit of an awkward decision to make here. Looks like he's uh, also considering just the Lava Burst here just to take the board dominance right now. But Lava Burst is a great tool in this matchup to target Thing from below specifically. It's just such a clean kill. Um, so I like him holding on to it just for, for a bit later on here. Yeah, and we can see Crane already has a multitude of defensive options. He has the Feral Spirits. It would overload him, but having two 2-3 two, taunt creatures against an aggro shaman is going to feel pretty good a lot of the time. And as you uh, mentioned, the thing from below is already in hand and is playable uh, this turn on four mana because he did play a totem in the previous turn. Yeah, I mean, if he does play it here and then trades for the Finley, which looks like a very natural play, there is a pretty promising looking punish in Aina's hand with the Lava Burst to clear out the 5-5 five five, and then the Abusive Sergeant to to push through damage, or he can just pick up the trade into the Totem Golem that we left at the 3-2 if he wants to go that way, so... He does um, go from the thing from below. I was wondering whether he was actually going to go for the Feral Spirit and Rockbiter to clear off the Finley, mm. and then just create a bigger board, and he knows Ellie's Destruction is, you know, going to be in the deck somewhere, of course. These players are aware of what the opponent's deck lists are, but I think that would have, you know, just gone a bit wider with the board as opposed to going, not all in, but just putting the, the one turn down. I think the problem with that is that due to the overload, it kind of messes up his curve for the next turn, because um, there wouldn't be a Totem play that turn, right? So Thing would still cost four. But he's he'd have, got that Flame Juggler. He'd have, yeah, he'd have three <laughs> mana on the following yeah. turn, still wouldn't be able to develop the 5-5. Five five. The 5-5 five five looked pretty appealing there. Sure, you trade it for a Lava Burst, but you know, the, the, he's not under too much pressure right now. Flame Juggler is still looking appealing versus this board right now. And that Harrison pickup could have a very, very big impact on this game because when your Warlock opponent takes Life Tap, you're pretty confident they will hit a Doomhammer at some point in the game. Yeah, exactly. And Doomhammer is, you know, as anyone who's played against this deck, is one of the most scary cards that there is. Uh, it can just provide so much damage over time, and, you know, the addition of just a rock, one rock biter just stacks up the damage up to 10 in one turn, which is kind of crazy. So having Harrison just sit there, Crane's. Crane's probably not going to play a tempo Harrison in the, in this matchup whatsoever. Seems unlikely. Um, yeah. And he is just going to be pretty happy holding on, although the rest of his hand doesn't look too great. Again, Crane's not had the opportunity to build up much of a board, so Bloodlust is feeling Ooh. very uh, very dead at the moment. And now that being overloaded when he has three five cost cards in hand kind of kind of sucks a little bit. He only has Rock Biter, and even Rock Biter doesn't really line up that well. Um, he could kill off the Totem Golem with uh, the Rock Biter and the Flame Juggler, but then he would lose the you know the only mini he had on the board at that point. Right, he can either just use the Rock Biter to take out the 2-1, or as you said, use it to leverage the trade into the 3-4. Now he rolled that 1-1 one, one Totem, suddenly just leaving the Abusive Sergeant isolated on the board is looking a lot more appealing. Um, so that seems to make a lot of sense, but this is kind of a weird position playing against a Face Shaman where you're sat there looking at your hand going, Damn, I really hope he draws Doomhammer next turn. That would be so good for me. <laughs> Not something many of us have thought too often. Yeah. I hope he gets that Doomhammer. But he does have a pretty straight up uh, next turn with the Thunderbolt Valiant and the Hero Power to just buff the total, at least the totem he summons. But he is going to tap. I'm just going to tap into Ancestral Knowledge. So all of the card draws going on. Uh, but falling onto one mana and no way to unlock the Overlord Crystals means that, again, both players are like. I don't really do rock by this turn. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this doesn't feel great. Yeah, and this is the problem with Shaman, really. As powerful as it is, and I think everyone will agree, it's definitely one of the, the top tier classes in the early shake-up of standard. It's one of the things that have come out on top. It 
whatever version you play of it, it does have this potential to draw awkwardly. If you're yep. playing the face version, you can hit all these burst cards too early before you're ready to make your push. If you're playing the mid-range version, you can just get this slow, clunky hand that doesn't fight. And also, the when you effect. throw overload into that, right. you know, it makes it even worse. And that was super interesting that Aina knows this turn could be Thunder Bluff plus hero power. Yep. But he did choose to leave the totem up and go for the damage because he's pretty much identifying I have Lava Burst and another Totem Golem in hand. Mm -hmm. I need to start hitting him in the face or I'm never going to win this game. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And even the Thunder Bluff here, even if it did buff the 1-1 one, one Totem, it doesn't have an impact on the board. It's not a punish for the Totem Golem. Yeah. He doesn't lose the value. So this is generally when you're playing the aggro deck, if you can hit face and you can't think of a feasible punish, then it's it, there's no reason not to because you are the aggressor. You have to establish dominance at some point. And you can see Crane seems to be favoring the Tuscar Totemic here, so he's not even going for the value of the Thunder Yeah, I, I think this is because he does have the um, the Rock Biter on the 1-1 one, one right. to just clear off the Totem Golem. Yep. If, if that uh, Totem was maybe anything else, he might not have gone for this play and just wanted to drop the Thunder Bluff down. Sure. But because he knows he can clear it off, no matter what Totem summoned, um, you know, it's pretty safe play and he's still got three sort of minions on the board even though two of the totems but there <laughs> is the doom hammer there is five mana available and suddenly crane already uh, probably pretty happy at this yeah i like this from aina though he's respecting the fact that there is doom uh, there is harrison jones in the deck yeah. sorry the deck lists are public we haven't yet mentioned that today all of these players know 30 cards from every deck of what their opponent is playing. So he knows if this is going to get harassed, the way he immediately loses the game is if he went he face the board up, yeah. If the board was still there and you get this harassed, you have no hope of winning the game at that point. You have a very small hope of winning the game right now, which, which is quickly being eclipsed by, that, <laughs> by these cards that are being drawn right now. But still, you have a hope. So I do like the trade from Aina there. Yeah, at that point, when, whenever you harassed uh, a Doomhammer, the card text may as well say, destroy Doomhammer. Hammer, draw all the cards you need to win the game. Yeah. Um, because this is pretty incredible. He can't even totem up and get the second thing from below for free, which just displays the power of this card when you are you play it in a deck where you're pretty much banking on like, uh, hero power in a lot of the time. Right. Yeah, Doomhammer card text, destroy your opponent's weapon and their soul, is, <laughs> is pretty much how I read so it. Yeah, I went for the more reasonable one, but obviously you went for the soul destruction yep. uh, idea, which, you know... Maybe says something, maybe doesn't. And speaking of destruction, this is the kind of situation right now where the card we talked about heavily at the start of the game, Elemental Destruction, is going to be what Aina needs right now. It's pretty much his only out. He can start lava bursting these minions one at a time to try and take them out, but there's no crackle in the format anymore, so his spot-for-spot -spot removal is very, very sparse in the deck, meaning he is going to need that big sweep, and it is just a one-of in his deck, in a deck that doesn't draw that many cards over the course of a game. Yeah, exactly, and even if he clears the board and say, say he taps into it um, and if he could play it this turn all of which things that you know you can't actually play because he wouldn't have enough mana if he tapped but um, uh, oh sorry yeah it would yeah, yeah it would yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, the, the heavy overload the following turn would be very grim if he didn't draw the uh, and unlock like Lava Shock but also even if the board's cleared look at Crane's hand he has all the options in the world and because Crane is still on 24 life you know, it's not as if uh, Aina can go for the burst out, you know, later and just hope, okay, he's pretty low. I'm going to draw into more spell bursts and finish the game. Uh, do you think that was a bit of an early concede? That, I mean, you can see the look on my <laughs> face right now. That's really surprising to me because you could see Aina was there in this, this kind of pose, the, the thinking pose. Often when you're playing an aggro deck like that, um, one of one of the skills that you have when you're playing it as a, a high level is you know calculating the percentage of cards left in your yep. deck and finding your out. So I thought he was sat there trying to find his 0.1% to win that game. You know, if I lava burst this minion, what happens? If I lava burst face, what happens? You know, how do I sequence my cards? What's my out? The fact that he couldn't find anything that gave him even a 1% chance of staying in that game, and it's not like concealing information in this format does anything. The deck lists are all out there. Yeah. Like it, it's it's and a also weird decision. To, to not even just live tap, right? right. Because he, he could draw one card straight off the bat there yeah. and see what happens. Because if it is early destruction, it does extend right. the game. And why wouldn't you want to extend the game, I right? Mean, just a little bit longer, maybe even a turn or two. Like, let's be clear. We're, we're talking ridiculous scenarios yeah. here. We're talking tap into elemental destruction that turn. And then his next draw is a Lava Shock, and he's able to develop a board. And then his draw after that is Doomhammer, and then he gets Rockbiter. Like, 
back to back to back perfect draws is what but we're talking about. But it can happen about. though, right? But like the level of importance of this game as well, right? Like it's just such so much on the line right now. Like stay in the game, see what happens. Yeah, but we are in the next game and it is going to be Aina on his mid-range warrior and Crane on his freeze mage. So again, we've seen a sort of a sprinkling of freeze mage matches mm -hmm. uh, so far. We saw some yesterday on stream, um, some really interesting plays in a uh, Freeze Mage now just feels more and more like a deck that can get either locked down very easily or just, you know, completely punish your opponent for in terms of the uh, the deck lineups. Uh, but even more so, I feel, than it was pre-expansion. Yeah, so when I was talking to Crane about him designing his lineup, when he, he came to the, the dawning realization that he couldn't bring Patron to this <laughs> tournament... Um, well, that was a dark day for him, it I really, It was a dark day for everyone, I tell you. <laughs> um, but yeah, when he... Um, had that realization and we started to put together different lineups, he said to me that Freeze Mage just seemed to be his best deck. It was just crushing all the practice sets that he was playing. Uh, but having said that, this is not the matchup he will have been looking for. Um, Tempo Warrior is um, kind of patron that can kill you in this matchup. You know, patron Warrior kind of out-survived Freeze Mage most of the time just by building up tons of armor. Tempo Warrior still has the tools to do that. Yeah. They also just have a bunch of threats that kill you over the course of the game. Yeah, and very awkward threats. And I think one of the key, well, there's a couple of key ones. There's, a, you know, one we can see in hand, which is Ken Bloodhoof, that Freeze Mage excels at clearing the board. But when it's a death rat, I'll resummon this minion effectively. Yeah. That's kind of awkward. But also Bloodhoof Brave, because if it doesn't die to, say, a Doomsayer, you know, Doomsayer Freeze turn, mm -hmm. then you kind of need to just pump a Fireball into it. And already when you're struggling with the armor of the Warrior, like, just throwing a Fireball into one is very rough. Because as you said, as well as the armor play, Midrange Warrior has a lot of just high damage. And this is a, a strong recognition of the situation here from Crane. Played out his Loot Hoarder. It was immediately contested poorly by the, uh, the Acolyte of Pain, so he simply pinged off his own Loot Hoarder, replaced it with a Doomsayer, which is a much better matchup for an Acolyte of Pain, but the Execute draw from Aina made quick work of it. And how do you feel about that Execute being used on a Doomsayer there, just to protect a little bit of card draw? Yeah, I think I think especially with Aina's hand, he doesn't really have a lot of the tools he wants. He mm. doesn't he doesn't have the Bloodhoof Graves to put on the pressure. Um, he probably wants Ragnaros as well at some point in this matchup. So I think valuing the card draw uh, and trading it off for an execute is fine. Um, there's a lot of there's only really a couple of big execute <laughs> targets in the deck anyway. Uh, just the amused smile there from Aina as Crane pinged off his own novice engineer. I mean. That looks like kind of a cute play, but he really had nothing else to do with his two mana yeah. that turn. So he may as well have got rid of it, made sure that the Acolyte couldn't farm it. But Aina's uh, deck is treating him quite well right now. First the Execute to deal with the Doomsayer, then the Blood to Ica to start cycling this Acolyte. Yeah, I really like Blood to Ica. I, I, when I first saw that card, I didn't really quite understand how flexible it is right. and how much work it does in Warrior specifically as mm -hmm. well. Because you benefit with things like, even if you do it to your own minions, like uh, we just saw Aina do there to draw cards. Also, it helps with Battle Rage. Mm -hmm. um, it can proc and execute on your yeah. opponent as well as summoning a 2-2. It, it's it's so powerful. And obviously, there's the whole synergy with Frothing Berserker as well. It's like a plus one to Frothing Berserker. Yeah, I mean, so. if, you're, if you're struggling to understand why that card is so good, you know, think of all of the scenarios where Cruel Taskmaster has been good for you, or like 90% of those scenarios, yeah. and then take one mana off what you're yeah, doing. Exactly. That's essentially what's happening. Yeah, and this board now is starting to stack up a little bit. Aina is going to proc the first Ice Barrier, and Crane has a Cairn Bloodhoof to deal with on the board, as well as trying to kill this Acolyte in one shot at least. He definitely doesn't want three draws from this guy. Yeah, for sure. He does have the Blizzard, which you know takes out the two, 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 two health minions right now and at least neutralizes that Cairn, so it's not representing any pressure for at least one turn. Does have to find a time to develop an Ice Block at some point here, and having now drawn that Arcane Intellect, he may decide that seven damage this turn is not too much to take and just go for the Arcane Intellect and develop the, the secret if he doesn't pick up anything better. Yeah, I think at this point in the game as well, because Crane hasn't seen armor smiths and not particularly a lot of armoring up from the warrior, he, he realizes he has the time, right? Like you said, the damage against him isn't too bad. Mm -hmm. And obviously the warrior's health isn't getting out of control. So you may as well cycle into the card you need to actually finish up the game with some burst. But I, this is something I've struggled a little bit with Freeze Mage and the, you know, the, the terrible loss of Mad Scientist to the format is that having time to actually play the secrets makes the, the, the deck actually a, a lot more difficult to play. Yeah, it, it certainly does. I mean, if you draw really well, 
it's a lot harder to fit it in because you have a bunch of other things you want to yeah. do with your mana. But if you're drawing really well, you're probably going to win the game anyway. Yeah. Um, most games where you draw kind of poorly, there's often one or two turns where you float a bunch of mana in a normal game, like a Mad Scientist Freeze Mage game anyway. Um, so it's, it's not that impactful a lot of the time. I think overall Freeze Mage came out way ahead with the loss yeah, of, yeah. of Lower Theb and all the death rattles from the game, apart from obviously Ken that we see on the board. But things like Piloted Shredder were really difficult and just in every deck that Freeze Mage faced. So. Yeah, this is looking pretty okay, though, for Aina. I mean, there is a Flame Strike, which is a card that sort of come back into the Freeze Mage deck because probably indicative of the, the, the way the meta looks at the moment in terms of sort of bigger, chunkier, slower minions, but also the fact that there's two cards gone for, from the uh, the deck in the form of those Mad Scientists right. as well. So you have a little space to mess around. So I think the standard really is like two Blizzards, one Flame Strike. Yes. And Flame Strike, a lot of the time, does get a lot of work done. Yeah, and Flame Strike is a little bit stronger in the current format as well, just a mm -hmm. little bit more effective and... Like you said, there is just those kind of flexible slots left in the deck now because of the removal. So playing that one flame strike does seem to make a lot of sense. It picks up decent value there. Still the can representing four additional damage on the board. And Aina has uh, extra pressure with the weapon. He has plenty of card draw in his hand with the Acolyte, which is just going to slam here to double up on his card draw. He does also have that battle rage to cycle even harder. And now a Malkarok, which can represent a big weapon in itself. But also there is the potential. <laughs> Do we even need to say it, Raven? I think everyone knows <laughs> at this point what can happen. I'll tell you something I've not seen yet. Mm -hmm. Pyroblast someone with Curse Blade. That's something, um, that's something I would like to see at some point. That Maybe not in this match one. specifically, of course. But um, but the good thing here is we saw the slam because I Aina has Grom and two activators already in hand, which is actually pretty important. Yeah. Because sometimes you you use your Whirlwinds and your uh, like Blood to Ica a lot in this deck to do other combinations. You can actually draw Grom and be like, Oh, I've actually not. What I've got like one doing? activator left right. in the deck. So that can be a little bit awkward, especially in the game where you want that burst damage if we say see an Alex Straza, you know, bring him back up to 15 later. Yeah, and the, the way the turns play out here, Crane is going to be under immense pressure for a, a large portion of it. As you said, Aina has the block pop in hand at any point now in the future that he wants it. There's only that one ice block left to be additional protection. So Freeze Mage in these late game situations is all about calculating how many free turns you have. If there's, there's a turn where there's an ice block popping and you have a second ice block in hand, you can count that as a free turn. If there's a turn where they can't pop your ice block, you can count that as a free turn. And you use all these options to just set up a win for yourself. Yeah, so it's how many when turns you, do I need to win the right, game? Exactly. And then how do I achieve that many yeah. turns? But the problem then becomes when you don't have those number of free turns, then what? And that's the really difficult games to solve as a Freeze Mage player. And Crane is trying to find the solution here. Yeah, and there's a multitude of options as well. Um, sort of that big card draw he got from the Acolyte with the Slam. It's really nice is he got, like, even just dropping, like, two Bloodhoof Braves is going to create a board that's very awkward to deal with for the Mage, but it does look like, and why not, it looks like this uh, this Gromit is going to prop the block. Yeah, Aina's going to choose to put him down to seven first before um, attacking with Grom. He, there is merit to holding on to the weapon in some situations here, but because he has that Malkarok yeah. in his hand, he knows he has extra weapons to back He knows he up, has that so. Curse Blade on the right. way. So if he puts his opponent to seven, say if the Grom oh, gets dealt with, at least there's that slight out of the immediate Gore Howl from the, uh, from the Malkarok to be able to pop. Uh, the second block if it comes down to that. So this sequencing seems correct. And like I said on the previous turn, Crane is now in a lot of trouble because he'll be looking at his hand and thinking that it's very, very difficult for him to find the number of turns that he needs here. Yeah, it's really difficult because looking at... There's, I think there's roughly two, two options here for Crane. He either just blizzards and presumes that he doesn't need to play Ice Block this turn because there's not... there's literally like a Gore Howl that realistically kills him. Maybe a Rag as well he's got to be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, or he goes with, he could Blizzard and Ice Block, but I think that's one of those issues where you've used two stall cards to only buy yourself one turn. Right, you have bought one turn, but during that turn you have done nothing, yeah, nothing to move to, your yeah, game plan exactly, forward. So yeah. that turn may as well have just not existed. Exactly, so I think it's definitely going to be one or the other. Mm. It's going to be interesting to see how he, uh, how he goes about this. It is going to be the Blizzard, and it is the, it does look like the Ice Block. Okay. So what this does, I mean, the way, the way we phrased it is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that you do this now and then next turn you have got yourself your free turn because you yeah. did everything you needed to do this turn and then you're hoping that that ice block holds and that sets up a win condition for you on the following turn because now he has this whole turn now free, safe behind that ice block. Yeah, and there's the uh, Bloodhoof Brave 
uh, double up there, and that is just so rough. Like, if another Blizzard comes down, mm -hmm. yeah, they're stalled for a turn, but then the Blood Hoofs hit for five each, uh, which is a lot of power. And they're still on four health, and we've already seen a Flame Strike, so there is pretty much just a Frost Nova Doomsayer that has any realistic chance of clearing this board. And mm -hmm. um, obviously, we can see there's no Frost Nova in hand, uh, but there's also no Execute in Ina's hand. And, double armor smith as well so next turn if Ina wants and he's not like you know already in a strong enough position as it is he can just drop double armor smith and say try and aoe this board down right he already has the seven armor so even if alex straza were to come down on his face right now he'd be at 22 life mm. and you are safe in the knowledge that when your opponent has not cast forgotten torches and when they have not played emperor Freeze Mage cannot do 22 damage. They max out at 21. So oh, nice even if, if he went for the offensive Alexstrasza play, which there would be no reason to because you're not setting up a win, um, Aina wouldn't even be forced to react with the Armorsmiths yet if he knows his Freeze Mage numbers because there's just no need to. Yeah, and there's even like double Armorsmith Ravaging Girl Whirlwind uh, if he really wanted to, right. to just go silly with armor. We did just see Crane put both his torches into Grom to just stall out the damage. He did get the Ice Barrier up, and now he's just relying on the... Uh, his opponent not being able to proc again Behold, through an Ice Barrier and the Frozen Air Bane Bloodhoof. Yep, so 15 total health right now. We have four in play. Frothing Berserker comes out. Execute number two is drawn. And a Ravaging Ghoul. So nothing too exciting from Varian, but still this board state is uh, kind of beyond repair now for Crane because even if he picks up the Freeze Effect to go with the Doomsayer, there's now the Execute in hand to deal with it. Yeah, and even if by some crazy scenario, uh, the, the game was stalled even longer, as I said, there is two Armorsmiths and the Whirlwind effect, which just further pushes Crane out of the game in terms of just yep. raw health. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly what I said at the start of the matchup. It's it's Patron Warrior that kills you. This is He has the double Armorsmith option in his hand ready yeah. to go, which is normally the Patron Warrior strategy in this matchup. But in the meantime, he's just put on this immense amount of pressure with the board that he's built. Uh, Frost Nova seems like a good pickup for Crane. Is able to try and get the Doomsayer to stick here, but second execute was drawn off that Varian Rin on the previous turn. Yeah, Crane is going to start just uh, playing on a little bit of damage. Use Frostbolt the face as well to negate the chance of a weapon being able Correct. to proc the Doomsayer. Yep. But you know what's pretty good at proccing proc it as well? Another Blood to Ike if he really wants to, but he does have a multitude of options. I imagine this looks like Armor Smith Whirlwind and uh, Execute. Armorsmith Whirlwind Execute oh, seems very, very and, reasonable. And then yep. watch the uh, Frothing Berserker get very, very angry. Yeah, I hope you guys like animations, because <laughs> we're going to see a few of them. And that's the thing as well. That's what I really like about Varian in this deck. Just putting a Frothing Berserker suddenly puts another... You put a 7-7 on the board and another huge threat that needs right. to be dealt with, even yeah. though at first it's just a 2-4. Yeah, if you get one other minion and draw yourself a slam and an Execute yeah. for your hand or something, like sure, that's, that's fantastic for you. Varian... In a, in a deck that does dominate, dominate board and just needs that one last push, Varian is a very effective card, and it's, it's great to see him being used, honestly, because he was a card that kind of was experimented with for a little bit when he was first released. That is going to be the end of the game, though. Aina squares it up one game to one, so both of these players picking up a win in the initial skirmishes and series is still very much in the balance. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I agree what we said, probably uh, what you said at the start of the set there, where um, Crane just got the matchup he really didn't want, and that yeah. matchup went exactly how you would you would describe it to someone, right? In the average game, that's what happens. And uh, and also, Aina didn't even draw Ragnaros, because if he had Ragnaros, that would have been even worse position for, the, for mm -hmm. Crane there. So it is 1-1, one, one, and uh, these guys have... Crane has his Mage still left of course and his rogue versus Aina's warlock and his shaman again so wh how do you think these these two decks versus each other match up yes yeah, so we have the freeze mage and the the cold blood miracle rogue left up against the um soulfire zoo and the aggro shaman so i would say there is a, a pretty decent chance of the freeze mage picking up a win here the the aggro shaman can definitely do some work against freeze mage no doubt but an early doomsayer means an awful lot in yeah. that matchup in terms of the freeze mage's success rate but um zoo classically not a fantastic matchup um against freeze mage so um we were talking about the this being the wrong matchup for him to get with freeze mage from his perspective the freeze mage i think he'll still be fairly confident he can pick up a win with um the rogue if if it comes up against the aggro shaman that's kind of unfortunate for him but again rogue players very confident with rogue against zoo because of all the ways they have to just leverage tempo yeah. on the board and get ahead yeah i think as well like i think against the rogue is probably the, the weak point there because i think Aina has a pretty okay matchups with both his decks like um because he's playing a much more like aggressive zoo with, with like the lira and the soul fire mm -hmm. sometimes you can just be too fast and the second and Crane doesn't draw a good opening with Rogue, like no backstabs, no SIs. Suddenly they can be in a little bit of trouble, but not too much of a surprise as we go into match three with Crane playing his Freeze Mage again versus 
Ina's facing. Yep, and um, plenty of early aggression in Ina's hand right here. Has the, the early minions that he'll be looking for. Eternal Sentinel, perhaps not the most optimal thing to follow up this Tunnel Trog, but still a minion that you can play on the board. Crane has a Loot Hoarder, which is nice. It's something to do early and start cycling his deck. But as I said, Doomsayer early is MVP in this matchup. If you can Doomsayer their one drop or Doomsayer their two drop if they coin out Totem Golem, that increases your win rate exponentially in this matchup because Although Doomhammer is a hell of a card in this matchup, that persistent damage, it only does 16 damage plus Rock Biters. And if they haven't been able to push through that early damage with the minions first, then you're in trouble. Yeah, it's like um, it's like both players agree to start the game at turn three, right. which benefits the mage way more than the exactly. Shaman here. And uh, speaking of benefits, I think Aina has a pretty good opening hand there from his Mulligan, whereas Crane probably on the, the rough end with those two very quite late game AoEs. We say yeah. late game for a six mana card, but late game when you're against Aggro Shaman. Yeah, for sure. And you saw Crane chose to make the greedy Mulligan. A lot of people would have said, hey, Loot Hoarder, this is a two drop. I can play it. This is awesome. I cycle through my deck. But Crane there was just looking for the better options. He really, really wanted that yeah. early Doomsayer. I totally agree with that Mulligan decision. It hasn't worked out for him, but you know this is one of the, the key skills in learning to Mulligan correctly in this game is you're not just looking for something to do on turn one and two. You're looking for the, the right correct, things yeah. to do the, the on turn The thing that's going to win two. you the game, let's be yeah, honest, right. the Doomsayer would potentially just straight up win, win him the game. All Although, um, we can see that even without the Earth Shot, there would have been double Lightning Bolts. There's a chance that he would have wanted to go in on that and guard his minions, which I think would have been highly likely. But still, um, you know, you still got to, I think, Mulligan for your actual, like, winning cards in matchups is sure. a quite a high level skill, actually. So Ice Barrier is in hand for Crane. Getting an Ice Barrier developed early enough in the game is very important because if you wait too long, the Shaman can just choose to ignore the Ice Barrier and just burn you down with Burst that they've built up in their hand. But still, he's only facing down two power on the board right now, so he probably feels the freedom to go ahead and Arcane Intellect, which is exactly what he ends up doing. Yeah, and also th this turn, even with the Trog on the board, there's realistically only so much power it can gain, right, from Overload. You know, right. it's normally only going to be like two. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like even then, you know, you can uh, normally face that down. And Ooh. interesting choice here. Life Tap would cycle like foot deeper into the deck and uh, maybe draw him the answers he needs. Uh, but he did have the Druid Hero Power, which is normally quite people quite like when they uh, rock into Doomhammer as well. Yeah. The the Druid Hero Power is kind of a trap. People always say, oh, this is so good with Doomhammer. It is just Hunter Hero Power that's only Hunter Hero Power when you have it with yeah. the Doomhammer. It only adds two extra damage. It is an option that you can definitely take, but I, I like him being brave and taking the Warlock there. A lot of people would have said, mm, how much do I really want to lower my own health against Freeze Mage? I open up this option for him to just burn me back at some point. But Aina realizes that this hand right now isn't going to win the game. He does have a bunch of damage built up, but he needs more board presence in order to push through the damage before yeah. the those burn spells finish And also, things. like, with the Druid Hero Power, the armor's nice, yeah. but how much is that really going to make a difference considering you're the aggressor, right? right? Like, normally you don't really care about your health a lot of the time because it's all about put pressuring your opponent making them react to you. And this is a pretty strong board here from Aina and having a good amount of spells in hand as well. This is, like, how you want the ma any match to really look for the Shaman. Just a lot of board presence early and then end the game with the spells late. Yeah, it certainly is. Crane can stall this board out for a long time here, though. He has Frost Nova into Blizzard into Flame Strike, which will take care of pretty much any board the Shaman can generate for the next few turns without any of them ever being able to attack. Um, so that puts him in a pretty reasonable position overall, but he's just going to choose to deal with the overall threat of the Tunnel Trog right now. And what that does is make his options more flexible, where he's not necessarily obligated to commit to that three-turn AoE chain. Yeah. And uh, not a bad draw as the huge Eternal Sentinel drops onto the board there and does unlock all the crystals since Aina did only have, uh, I think, two mana available that turn anyway. Yeah, that was actually an insane yeah. draw. He <laughs> overloaded himself a crazy amount on the previous turn, didn't have an unlock mechanic in his hand and picked up the Eternal Sentinel straight away to pull it off and just allowed him to pressure much more effectively this turn. Yeah, Crane just going for a, again, just probably just like the brave play of just playing Emperor down, reducing all his cards down. It does look like we have a, a small uh, issue with the top player's hand. He's uh, dead, right? I'm pretty sure he's just dead. Oh, okay. Uh, six, yeah, you eight, were doing nine, the counting 14, now, I saw 17, that. Yeah, he has 23 in hand with exactly six mana. Crane is actually just dead. Wow. Double Lightning Bolt, Lava Burst, Rock Biter.
<laughs> and Ina, Ina just counted three times, and then we just saw a little fist pump. <laughs> He's just going to count it one more time, but I'm pretty sure. I've only counted once. I'll do it again. <laughs> uh, so that, four, seven, nine on the board, plus five is 14. 17, 20, yeah. 23 damage. So yeah, this is lethal for Ina. I completely agree with what you were saying. I cut you off a little bit, and I apologize. He, he made the brave play yeah. with the Emperor Thorasan. He gets punished for it in this situation, but it's an important thing in Hearthstone to realize that sometimes the right play loses you the game but it's the right play because in the highest like percentage yeah. of situations, it's going to win you the game. Yeah, and Crane just looking a little bit disappointed, and that's understandable, but you know, crazy game for Ina there, just pulling out a win. And let's be honest, how important was that Eternal Sentinel draw? Because that just ch opened up the whole turn for him as opposed to what would have almost just been Hero Power Pass. Yeah, there were two, two things that were really important in that game from my perspective. Firstly, the Eternal Sentinel, huge draw. Able to get the Abusive Sergeant, got a life tap in as well, I think, for some more resources. But just taking the life tap itself. Yeah. Because if he hadn't, he would have been stuck with just that Lava Burst, Lightning Bolt, Lightning Bolt hand that ended up winning the game for him. But it ended up winning the game because he tapped into more board presence to keep himself going over the game. He tapped into that Eternal Sentinel, yeah. essentially, because the extra cards that he yeah, drew... Yeah, he deeper into the deck, right, right? exactly. Got him deeper, made that his draw on that turn. Yeah, and then... Uh, this is uh, looking a little bit rough for Crane. He probably uh, really wanted that Freeze Mage win just to get it out of the way. Um, but Ina done a really good job there of just getting the uh, the quick win with the Shaman. That pretty much went as he wanted it to go, right? Yeah. Just had all the minions early on. And Crane just didn't quite have enough. Again, no Doomsayer to uh, early enough to really just lock the board down. And he does just have his Zoo left versus Freeze Mage and Rogue. So I'm actually fancying Ina's chances here. I think, I think you have to. I think... Neither of these matchups are terrible for yeah. Crane. The Freeze Mage can definitely get the job done against Zoo. The Rogue matchup, a lot of factors can come into it. Who gets the coin? Yeah. Whether you have backstabs and SI agents in your opening hand, whether you get a big swing turn with prep fan of knives on spell damage or something like that. But it's another matchup that you know most ro most competent rogue players will feel like they're fairly comfortable in. Sounds but like most competent rogue players feel stuck. <laughs> exactly. But the big swing is that he has to do it twice. And even if you have two 60% favored matchups to win, to win a series. You're still statistically yep. unfavored to win that series. So even with these two matchups, we're kind of, eh, you know, they can go either way. When you have to do it twice, you're in trouble. Yeah, it's uh, definitely going to be an uphill climb for Crane here. Is, I mean, now it doesn't really matter which deck he picks, I suppose. I was going to say, like, what do you think about which one he's going to go in with first? I think it's interesting that a lot of players at this point just go, Freeze Mage again, because I need to win with it. Why not? But I think uh, some players actually do get affected by just lost two games with this deck. I, maybe I want right. to take a break like, and just play something else. Like, Freeze Mage, I know you're good, buddy, yeah. but you haven't been doing it. Just chill over there for a bit. Take a just, break. Yeah. Take so, sort your life out. Come back. We'll win a game in a minute. Um, but I would expect Crane to go with Freeze Mage again. Just, you know, this would just, if I was playing against Crane here, this would be kind of a soul read situation. Just say, he's going to pick Freeze Mage because I know he likes that deck. He trusts yeah. it. He knows that he needs to get the win here. He needs to get himself rolling. Freeze Mage is a deck that he trusts implicitly, so I would expect him to go with that first. Yeah. But like you said, not a big impact. Yeah, strategically exactly. on the game. And uh, just to point out again, guys, that this is a very, very important match for these two players. Um, whoever wins actually goes through to top eight, which is going to be huge. And uh, Aina, again, probably, the, well, pretty clearly the underdog in terms of just names overall here. But uh, this is a huge match for him. And this could be his last game to make it through to top eight and go to the championships. Yeah, and as I pointed out, this is a culmination of three months worth of work yeah. for these guys, essentially. You know, Aina has had a bunch of a bunch of solid legend finishes. He's picked up a fifth place, a 27th place. You know, that's an enormous grind over the course of several months. And the reason that you're doing it is for this exact moment right here where you have the chance to pay it all off. And all he has to do is pick up one single game with Zoo. Yeah, this is definitely tense and uh, very quick mulligan. He's like, nope, I, I know what I want in this matchup and it's none of those guys. <laughs> none of these cards are flaming. Please <laughs> yeah. go back. Whereas Crane taking a little bit more time does keep hold of the Thanos. I think a lot of that comes down to it's something he can do on turn two, definitely, and it can trade with some of the minions that Zoo plays, and it cycles him a well, card. He chose to keep the Blood Mage and didn't keep a Novice Engineer, so he was specifically favoring the Blood Mage to have the flexibility of something to play, or the usage yeah, or of the a Frostbolt yeah. for four damage, or something like that on a future turn. So, yeah, and now we're going to see how uh, how this Flame Juggler is going to go, and it does yeah. snipe the loot order. That is actually a pretty big deal. I can see that coming because I saw on Ina's camera he gave the little gunshot signal <laughs> as he played the Flame Juggler. So he's Obviously a little bit ahead of our view, saw it happen already, and that immediately imposes the board dominance for, for Zoo. But this is not a matchup that's really about early game board dominance. It's about whether the Freeze Mage can stall the Zoo for long enough in order to, to stack up the burn damage in their hand, essentially. 
Yep, and then we see uh, one of the new cards, and I think most loved cards for any Zoo player of the new set. Oh, I was going to say, the for Zoo players. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But is the Councilman, and no one really uh, appreciated how good this was going to be, I think, or not, not many people at least. And it's actually just insanely powerful at that five health. And again, another high health creature for the maze to actually struggle to deal with. Normally, early game, you can like, okay, well, I can pretty much Frostbolt any minion he plays and it dies, and yep. suddenly it's like, ah, five health, that's kind of awkward. Right, I had this conversation with TJ on a cast yesterday where everyone just kind of looked at the one and went, yeah. one? Uh, one attack? Why would I want that? And everyone just kind of ignored that big fat five sitting there, <laughs> which makes it pretty much impossible to take off the board on turn three. And uh, Crane is having the reaction that many players do when this guy is dropped on turn three, which is Welp. Uh, I'm in a lot of trouble. I need to find a way to deal with this right now. He doesn't have one, so I think we just end up casting Arcane Intellect this turn, trying to get more resources. Yeah, and again, same situation. You definitely want Doomsayer against Zoo to just play and just slow the board down. Even though we do see some Zoo players playing the uh, Alchemist to uh, actually, you know, just insta-kill a Doomsayer, it's still not too common in the list. It's definitely just like a, a style pick. He did draw into the Doomsayer though, and he does have Frost Nova, so he's probably going to try and stall one more turn and do Frost Nova Doomsayer as Aina just piles on the pressure with that Die Wolf and the uh, Knife Juggler to just, uh, so much. And suddenly the Councilman is attacking as a 4-5 this turn. Right, and it appears looking at Aina's list that he is not running the um, the crazed Alchemist in his deck, which is going to give him a lot of trouble when it comes to that Doomsayer. Yeah, I mean, there's there's pretty much no way to deal with it in, in Zoo if you don't have the Alchemist, right? Because uh, Owl's just not now really Owl's ran gone, anymore. Yeah, yeah. Much. yeah people, people toyed with the idea of maybe we play Spellbreaker in Zoo now when Standard first came out, but that very quickly was established at not being particularly optimal. I think ev everyone thought, do I play Spellbreaker right. in all my decks now? Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of the natural, natural response, yeah. right? But yeah, and they... People very quickly solved the equation and said, well, actually, most of the things that I kind of want to silence, Doomsayer is one of the big ones. Crazed Elk does that job pretty well anyway. Yeah, and I really like this play. Remove the Die Wolf off the board. It is representing four damage effectively. And they're ice lancing the, the Councilman just to say, because something like, um, like a... What's the spell? Uh, forbidden, forbidden Ritual, ritual. that's yeah. the word. I, ne I nearly got there. I knew it was Forbidden something. Uh, can like make this, make this Councilman attack... Quite silly, to be honest, but he does build up the turn for the Frost Nova Doomsayer. And what's interesting here is, what, what do you think about this? Like piling everything onto the board at this point into turn five against Freeze Mage. Do you think that's a bit too heavy there? Honestly, I think Einar is just feeling it right now. Yeah. He's sat vibing in his chair. He was celebrating He's the flame He's playing very quickly as well. Right, I think he just feels the momentum on his side. And this, this can happen in a game of Hearthstone where you just think, he's not going to have it. Like, this is going my way. He's not going to have it. I'm just going to push and win the game right now. Unfortunately for him, he does have it. It's going to have to be a life tap pass turn. He's just going to play the villager just yeah, to like have a 1-1 one, one on the board. Yes, he's fine. Yeah, and he has a decent reload capability as well. He does have the two in gang boss that are, you know, pretty resilient in themselves, summoning those 1-1s one uh, whenever they take damage. And we see the possessed villager. The reason that was played is, as you said, just to have a minion on the board. There's still cards like Abusive Sergeant, like Power Overwhelming, that means he can get something done on his following turn, potentially. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really interested in the reactions of the two players here. I, I keep watching them out of the corner of my eye. When that Doomsayer went off, there was a reaction from Crane, who was kind of slumped back in his chair a little bit to say, all right, now we can play Hearthstone. And now he's leant forward again. He's yeah. back into the game. Like Now that Doomsayer has gone off, he feels much more engaged. He feels like this is his moment to push back into the series. Yeah, he was probably actually, although he took a chunk of damage, he was probably really happy to see all those minions just right. thrown onto the board. Yep. Because also, as we said, Crane knows he doesn't play the Alchemist, yep. so he knows that like, this Doomsayer just almost certainly won't die. Why you see Aina now just reloading the board, um, but he ha I feel like he has lost a lot of momentum. He's lost a ton of momentum, yeah, and it's giving Crane a lot of time. He is, His hand is a little bit awkward right now. He has things like Ice Barrier number two, which aren't really perfect right now. What he'd like to do is just start building up a big stack of burn in his hand at this point, because Zoo is a matchup for Freeze Mage, which often skips the Alexstrasza stage of proceedings. You very often just, they've life tapped a bunch and played a couple of yeah. Flame Imps, and then you're able to just burn them down straight over the course of a couple of turns. So he'd be looking to pick up maybe one or two more burn cards to go along with these AoEs that he have, but the Flame Strike there was pretty nice just leaving behind yeah, the exactly, two residual yeah. imps. And this, he's going to play the Forbidden Ritual, which looks great. You see there, Crane's like, okay, yep. I have Blizzard. Got it's like <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is going to be rough. You know, no, nothing against Diner there either. Like, he needed to do something and fill up the board, and that 
is an Alex Straza in hand. Yeah, I was going to say Blood Mage Blizzard looks very, very yep. attractive here. If the Blood Mage sticks to the board, it suddenly becomes a source of spell damage that you can use. But having now drawn that Alex Straza, he does have the option just for offensive Alex Straza on the next turn if he feels like he has enough freedom. Yeah, and is really going to want this juggle to land on the Thanos here. And, oh, not not quite trained as well as his Flame Juggler from earlier. But uh, but still, he's, he's got a bit of power on the board, but just feeling like this game's just slipping it away from Aina here. It is, yeah. So 17 health from Crane, staring down six from his opponents. His opponent would need 11 damage to kill him. He does not have a block in play right now. So this is literally betting his tournament life or his chance to qualify on this decision to offensive Alex Straza. So I think he's in such a comfortable position yeah, in this can game. Take his time, right? I like this decision to not, go, not to go all in here, just to hedge his bets a little bit, cycle some more cards, picks up exactly the kind of things he's looking for, just more cycle, picks up more options. Ice Barrier comes down to give him some time. Clear board again, which is the nightmare for Zoo, whenever yeah. you have nothing on board. And this is the thing as well, he could have Alex Straza and been very aggressive in that yep. sense, but his backup play wasn't exactly terrible. Right. Get an ice barrier on the board, clear the, the, the opponent's board, and to be honest, one of the game plans against Zoo, no matter what deck you play in, mm -hmm. is if you keep their board empty, there is no way for them to do anything because they're so board-centric of a deck. Right, and the other thing that will have factored into it for Crane is that he didn't have the immediate kill the turn after either. either. Yeah, he would he didn't have needed have the to find up, two yeah. turns with Pyroblast and then some extra burn. But now he's decided that it is time to go, and this looks about right to me. Frostbolt Ice Lance, attack with the Novice, yeah, even face, an ice lock. mana to equip the Ice Block if he wants to, and then he just has that Pyroblast follow-up. Lotheb has been cut from the game. No healing in the zoo unless there is a peddler into Voodoo Doctor. So this is pretty much game. Yeah, and this um this this was really rough. And I I honestly think looking at the start of this match, Aina was playing very quickly and obviously excited because the start he was feeling it. He the start looked incredible. Right. Like he was off to a, an amazing start with the with the game here, but. I feel dumping everything onto the board into a turn five versus Mage. He had a lot of power on the board anyway. Like mm -hmm. I don't think he needed to, you know, completely commit everything he had into it and just uh, leave himself with one card as well. Because now we see his, his hand was like power overwhelming into Leroy, you know, there was no, not enough good refill there for him, especially after the flame strike. I mean, I will present the counterpoint to that, which this is essentially his free matchup. This is the matchup where he's unfavored in anyway. Yeah. So, you know, he, he was feeling himself. I, I totally agree. He was just had that kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm going to championships feeling. He's just like, this is going to work. I'm just going to play it. But honestly, that might be the right attitude because this is the matchup which you're kind of unfavored in anyway. So you might as well take a risk, right? Just try and push right yeah. there. Try and get the series over. Yeah, I do agree. Because let's be honest, the second Crane didn't have it, he just wins, right? You know, like he yep. pretty much just take the win off the bat there. Yep. But Crane is going to even it up. And this is going to 2-2. Two, two. So it's going to be the last game, which is Rogue versus Zoo. I'm really looking forward to this. I kind of like watching Rogue quite a lot at the moment. It's such an interesting deck. And so many crazy things can happen with this. Um, it's going to be... It's going to be pretty cool, and I think a lot of it is going to rely on how the mulligans go for both players. Yeah, it really is, and both players will mulligan extremely hard for the coin. Yeah. That that <laughs> will happen. Uh, we'll see which one you of them is able do to that? get it. Uh, like. yeah, not really. Um, but yeah, obviously, rogue players always want the coin. Zoo players as well. Big deal with getting yeah. the coin a lot of the time because it al allows you so much more flexibility with your early game curve. But on top of that, in this matchup as the zoo player, not only do you want the coin, you want to deny the rogue yeah, player. Yeah, a lot the coin. of it is not letting right. him have the coin. Um, <laughs> so on top of who gets the coin, it's going to be things like early tempo cards for the rogue. Do they get the backstab? Do they get the SI7 agent? Things like that. Are they able to put together a big swing turn with Azure Drake preparation and spells, for example? Now we see the coin is going to Aina, which is a very, very big deal, as we mentioned. Crane does get a prep though which is a very nice card to at least make up for some of that loss of the coin in your hand yeah so do you, so speaking of mulligans here because I, I think this is, is like you said the matchup is very defined by these mulligans what do you keep in crane's hand because rogue is a very intricate class that the second you don't get the opening you need you can really be punished for it uh, i don't particularly like tomb pillager against zoo i think it's just too easily traded into by the opponent we use it using a buff 
Um, I will keep preparation against in any tempo matchup just because it's such a key card, if, especially against Zoo, where one swing on the board and you've probably won the game if you can just end up with one minion versus no minions or something, for example. Preparation is a great tool to allow you to do that. Deadly Poison is the borderline card for me here. It is useful, gets a lot of work done in the early game, but since the loss of Blade Flurry or the, the nerf to Blade... Everyone says the loss of Blade Flurry as if it's, <laughs> it's just been, been deleted. deleted. Yeah, it's, it's still gone. here, guys. It's actually not a bad card still, but no one's playing it. Um, Deadly Poison is less effective than it used to be, so that's the borderline card for me because keeping the hand of prep poison seems a little bit sketchy. Yeah, and I actually like it. I think there was a knife juggler originally in Anya's hand, and I actually like the throw mm -hmm. um, because it now is just a 2 2. You always want to actually combo it with, you know, guaranteed juggles, so it's not like you always want to play it on turn two, especially against Rogue. And as that gasp of of horror or excitement, I'm not quite sure, Sol. The double Flame Imp play is an option with the coin. There's something about double Flame Imp that just, just rustles my jimmies, Alex. <laughs> I, I, I can't, it's just so much pressure to be able to put out on turn one. It's just yep. an absurd amount of damage. Just, yeah, I played two three twos on turn one. Your turn, buddy. Yeah, this is definitely rough. I mean, is there even an option that we see some kind of um, I uh, prep with a vase and so he can dagger up as well to set up the deadly poison for next turn because I also feel like you, you could overreact to this even though it's a lot of pressure you could overreact and that might actually lose you the game so we do see crane there just if this one and just just be chill about it and know okay there's one gone I'm gonna you know continue to build up the following turns yeah I, I I think the prep would have been a definite overreaction. One of the big ways you can also win this matchup is just getting a big prep Van Cleef turn off yep. if he does pick up a Van Cleef soon. And the prep is super useful for the sort of situation where I, um, I elaborated earlier with spell damage swings on the board with things like Fan of Knights. But every decision is of the utmost importance for both of these players right now because yep, they are both everything. one game away from qualifying from championships. Everything is here. These are some of the most important decisions they've made in Hearthstone in their entire lives. So they will be trying to make sure that everything they've learned up until this point is helping them make all the optimal decisions that they need right here. Yep, and the Voidwalker and the Possessed Village is really not bad turn two, actually. The Voidwalker protects the uh, the Flaming, which is really what you're trying to do here from the, you know, like a da dagger and a deadly poison here. And the Possessed Village is just always nice as it just has that habit of just sticking around on the board. You can't really get rid of it a lot of the time. But Aina's, the rest of his hand doesn't look too great. It does not, no. That Sea Giant is a long way away from uh, from getting anywhere. The Dark Iron Dwarf is not a good pickup here either, so he'll be looking for another one drop. All right, this is the turn the Rogue player needed. Yeah. This is actually a swing on the board right now. He can deal with a lot of this board with the Tomb Pillager, with the preparation, try and take oh, care of yeah. some of these answers. He's just going to go ahead and use the Deadly Poison, take care of the Flame Imp. This does allow Power Overwhelming to be a swing back the other way, which is a card that you probably expect is one of those dead cards in your opponent's yeah, why hand, having would he just seen them pass. Right? Yeah. Unless it's double C Giant. <laughs> like, but yeah, this is, and also the Peddler as well, you know, you do have the option of three cards with that Discover mechanic, and what's nice is, depending on the card he picks, oh, another Voidwalker. So he is why able to play the one drop and Power Overwhelming and clear the Tomb Pillager and leave the one one still alive from the Possessed Village Death Rattle. Backstab would be a clear here if he's able to pick it up. That would be probably one of the better cards in his deck right now. Picks up Cold Blood number two. That is not what he's looking for. He is playing Leroy in his deck. It's not the pure board control version yep. that some people run. So he does have the potential for a lot of burst damage, but burst damage is not what he's concerned with right now. He needs to be able to answer this board from the Zoo player. Cold Blood obviously completely useless at doing that. So yeah, and suddenly, even though it feels slightly off curve, and his hand doesn't look too bad, if any of these minions stick and it's looking fairly likely, then, you know, even just Flame Juggler tap or just Dark Iron Dwarf, um, you know, move on, just put a 4-4 on the board, um, it's going to look quite powerful. And also, the longer these minions stick, the easier and easier it is to get Sea Giant down. He does still have a technical board clear here. Um, he can Shadow Strike, Coin Prep, Fan of Knives, and then Dagger. Uh, it just, that doesn't seem it, wise. It, he can do that. Yeah, so he can while, do that. While you're on the topic of, you know, if any of these minions survive, then suddenly yeah. all these cards in my hand start to become relevant. That's a thing you are thinking when you're playing against Zoo. It's just how much better all these cards in their hand become if you leave any minions alive. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to find the full swing. Um, I definitely think that would have been a huge overreaction from Crane if he would have done it, but the possibility was there. Yeah. So I feel like there's a, a couple of options really here. There's a Dark Iron Dwarf to push for more damage, um, or he could have Flame Juggled and Forbidden uh, Ritual. He looks like he's going to go for Dark Iron and just put the 1-1 on the board with the Ritual. 
ritual, which is pretty nice. He's not seen a fan of Nairage yet, so it's not like he's holding off on it for a big, you know, turn to just get blown out with fan. And now this auctioneer could change everything. He has a fan, he has a prep. This fan of knives is about to cycle him two cards. That's two fans now. Uh, but after this prep is used, after this fan is used, he only has one mana remaining, which dramatically limits his options in being able to answer oh. this. Backstab just came too late. He doesn't have anything else particular. He may just choose to cycle one of the cold bloods on the auctioneer here just to get another card into his hand. Yeah. Um, there, there are some moments where you weigh up backstabbing your own gadget, Zan, if that's what you have to do to cycle. I, uh, I feel against Zoo when backstab's such a high value card. This is right. not one of those moments. So he is just going to use the cold blood and say, Okay, put your Dark Iron Dwarf into the gadgets because you almost have to, but then you've got nothing on board and you know I'm gonna stay ahead with all that card draw he's gained because he did get sap, backstab, SI7 agent, still got his second fan. Right. There's a lot of tools in his hand now to be able suddenly, to do Suddenly this. he has the kind of hand he would have loved to have had on turn three or four. Yeah. He has all these options that would have been enabled him to take pick apart that small board that Ayn has been beating him away at him with this entire game. Picked it up late, but it might be just in time. I think one turn later, he would have been too far behind in this game to make an impact. It may be enough to get the job done here. Yeah, but bear in mind, Aina is running Leroy and does have a soul fire, and yep. Crane is on 11 health. Like, that is very scary, and Crane will be fully aware of this, and Crane will probably also know that that card in Aina's hand has been in there for a while, and although it could be a sea giant, it could be Leroy, because there's been no opportunity to play Leroy, why would you have played it uh, up until this point? So, you know, he's definitely got to think about that as there is quite a lot of power on the board. There's five power on the board for the Warlock at this moment in time. Picks up preparation number two, uh, which doesn't have a huge impact right now. Backstab Sap looks like the play he was always going to make. He has that amount of mana available to him already, so preparation doesn't change anything, but it does speed up his hand for the following turn. And now, finally, it's taken longer than he would have hoped, but he is there. He has that full swing on the board where he is one minion versus zero against Zoo, which is the situation that you always, always want. Yeah, Abusive Sergeant, not quite what Aina would have wanted to take off the top there. He did uh, tap into the Dark Peddler and he will have another choice, so a card like Power of Whelm and another Abusive to hope something sticks on the board or hope that Leroy comes exactly when he needs it. It's a another Voidwalker, so this guy just gets to select a Voidwalker anytime he plays that card, it seems, which is fine. Um, but now at least he's putting a few more minions on the board, right? Because at the moment, Oh, that draw is insane. That Blood Mage is nuts right here. Blood Mage, Fan of Knives, is a complete board clear. He can even prep it to try and pick up more pressure and start pushing damage with Cold Blood. This is all starting to come together for Crane right here. Yeah, this is pretty insane. As again, all Ayn has been trying to do for so many turns is to just keep minions on the board. And as you said, Crane's drawn into the cards that he wanted early game to just completely remove everything and clear it as efficiently as Rogue does. So, Abusive Sergeant is in hand, which can increase the damage output of Leroy if that is drawn, but it's not enough to deal 10. So, Ayn is going to need Runner, Runner, Leroy, Soulfire here. That's the only way I can see this working. Oh, Die Wolf is definitely not that. And That's there it. we go. The game is over. Crane has booked his spot at Spring Championships. The culmination of three months' work, the culmination of a ton of work from Crane individually, putting the time in to become a top tier Hearthstone player. He has finally made the point that we as casters have been trying to make for so long. He is going to Championships. Yeah, and what an impressive performance, too. You know, falling behind there. And I, I don't look like he was playing in that second game or in the fourth game when he was up two to one, like he'd already won. Yeah, who's so he was chill, whipping right? out his cards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boom, flame juggler, got yeah. ya. Yeah. Uh, but a, a really fitting game to sort of end that series. Crane falling behind at the beginning, mm -hmm. but then yeah. coming back to take it at the end. So uh, really, really impressive stuff. I, I really enjoyed that series. Yeah, the series was really, uh, really interesting. There's a lot of cool points there. We didn't see the Leroy Soul fire out of Einer in, in his zoo games at all, but just you've got to give it to Crane. I mean, again, just to echo what you said, we all know how good that guy is. Yeah. We have known for a very long time. And if I'm honest, I'm really happy that he's got his spot in the top eight now to you know give his chance to prove himself as the player we all know he is, actually. Yeah, personally, I'm obviously just over yeah. the moon for <laughs> Him. I'm on a Slight team bias, on a team you know. with him currently. He's also just one of my favorite players. But even before he was my teammate, you've been a teammate with him yep. before in the past. Hopefully, I managed to hide my bias for most of the. <laughs>
that series, but now that it's over, good job, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, again, to sort of reiterate that point, that means he is going to the spring championships, yep. uh, which will happen next month. So uh, a shot at making it to the world championship at BlizzCon as well. You know, a shot at uh, getting points again for the for the next season. Putting himself in that top eight is really a huge deal. And I, I still has another chance. That was an upper bracket match, yep. so he'll yep. fall down to the lower bracket to face off against uh, some players that are going to win throughout the day. But right, it's 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 not the end of his tournament, but it is a setback because yeah. of the way double elimination works. You've now essentially slid backwards in the bracket. Mm -hmm. You now have to win a couple more games to get back to where you were. Whereas yeah. Crane has picked up the immediate qualification, and the snowball effect from this point is massive. Your championships and then potentially moving forward to BlizzCon that puts you in insane positions for the following series as well. So crazy stuff. Yeah, and he did it without Patron Warrior, something yeah. that uh, it, that was his fault back all the time. It was yeah. the Patron Warrior that was <laughs> causing him issues. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, uh, if, if you had told me, you know, a couple weeks ago, or wh even when Sander first came out, people thought that Patreon was actually pretty good. Yeah. Right. I actually lost a couple games on ladder yesterday against Patreon. I was like, did you get the memo? <laughs> Stop it. Like, Talk did, to no. Crane, Did okay? you watch yesterday? Crane even said yeah. it's not that in a great spot. But uh, being able to sort of do it with, you know, just a, a good deck lineup, you know, a solid deck lineup um, that... Uh, Branching out a little bit is, is a pretty big deal. Is that a tough thing to do when you're a sort of like, not a one-trick pony, but known for a certain deck uh, to sort of branch out and master other decks? Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, Crane's put a, a lot of time into Patreon, probably more than almost anyone, and to just have to accept that, okay, I'm not bringing this to the biggest tournament of my life, probably, because um, he just doesn't feel it's quite there yet is a big mm. deal, because previous to this, I'm pretty confident Crane's played Patron in every single lineup ever possible. Yep. Uh, so, you know, and, and obviously you know him as a, as a current teammate. Yeah. That it was probably a tough decision that maybe even took some persuading at one point. Even in a kind of special format tournament that I cast him in, where it was um, single class that you had to bring, and you had br brought two different decks from one class, he brought Patron and Worgen combo patron <laughs> that was his lineup so it's so hard for him to get away from it but it's it's a it's a case of head over heart i guess where he knew that what was more important was the path towards BlizzCon and progressing along that. And he felt his best chance to do that was to overrule, overrule that feeling in his heart <laughs> that said that you have to bring Patron, bring what he thought was the best lineup, and he's been rewarded for that. Yeah, it turns out being able to master one deck means you're just pretty good at Hearthstone. We saw Chestu yep. with Rogue, Dr. Hibby with Freeze Mage, and now Crane will be having his shot. Uh, at the Europe Spring Championship. So uh, we are going to send it over to a man that actually predicted Crane to make it. <laughs> it is going to be Frodan standing by with an interview. Attaboy, Crane. Good job. Way to take it home for the team. Crane has joined us with a winner's interview. I want to talk to him about what it's like qualifying for the Spring Championships. So, Crane, tell me how you're feeling right now, man. That was quite a thrill of a series. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling amazing, but it's like... When you're on the edge and you know it's like just one Leroy, he has like double soul fire. So it's Leroy, PO, Leroy, soul fire from me losing. So it's like, uh, I just gotta calm down before it really settles in, I, I think. But I'm super happy. I mean, I've been super focused the the last two days. I mean, sometimes some, sometimes you're a bit too excited, sometimes you're a bit nervous, but I, I feel like I was, yeah, a good middle ground like for this one. What was the mindset going into day three? It, it, it becomes very dramatic because you only have one series, so it feels like you want to focus on it. Plus, it was against an opponent that I, I wasn't sure if many people were expecting because Oskaka was the person that people were thinking maybe matching up against you, but he ended up upsetting Oskaka. Uh, so tell me some of the preparation that you're able to do from last night going into this morning. I mean, I didn't need to do any extra preparation. He had the same lineup as Faramir, so I just like, thought to myself a bit, I, I talked to Laughing who said that Inna is a great freeze mage player, so it made more sense to ban his freeze mage over the shaman. Also, his shaman was, I felt a little inconsistently built, so it's just a deck that can, like it's scar scary for me to face the shaman because my lineup is not very good against it, particularly after he bans, but it's also scary for him to have to play that deck because it's so inconsistent, and I don't feel like aggro shaman at all is that great, so yeah, it's just... Yeah, that's the only preparation I did. I talked to Oskaka, and uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, it's great that you're able to chat with Oskaka and you know get that camaraderie in. Now, Crane, I predicted you to hit top eight. However, I do want to point it out that you also were the second round pick for me, meaning that 
not only did Sottle and Raven pass you by, but a bunch of other people chose to pass you over. Uh, but, I mean, in the end, we did pick you here. Did that put any pressure? Or, you know, what do you think about some of the fact that we were predicting you to put top eight? Was that, and people were starting to put expectations on you. Did that add to the weight on your shoulders at all? Uh, no, not at all. But I think it would be kind of silly if I wasn't picked, like, by somebody. I mean, come on. I'm always in the top of the standings, <laughs> always the top of the ladder. I had a good run last regionals. I mean... Like, how more consistent can you get? Yeah, I agree. And that's why uh, I felt like it was too good. I can't believe you actually slid all the way down to me, especially because, you know, I know Sato was a big fan as well as uh, some of your other UK boys. So, yeah, But he had the had first, like, the very first pick. I'm I'm sure if I would have been, I, if I wouldn't have been taken and it was his turn, like, the second pick, he would have also picked me. Yeah. No doubt there, no doubt there. All right, well, now you're the first of eight people to qualify. Do you have your own prediction? Maybe just pick one other person that will be meeting you in the Europe Spring Championships next month. I mean, Tice is just, like, the obvious pick because he's already in the winner bracket. It's like he has a super good chance, but I also think Oskaka still has a great chance. Like, Oskaka and my lineup, they are almost the same, like, just a couple tech cards different. And I, I'm, I've been so happy with my lineup, except Faramir and Ina, you know, like they had good lineups against uh, me and Oskaka's lineup. But like the lineup, I feel is super good. So it's not just by random that he also got far in the tournament. And since he seemed to be playing decently, like he should have a good shot, even though it's three wins in a row that he needs. All right, so those cool. would be my two picks. Also, I don't know all the other players because I've just been so <laughs> sure focused in on the your zone for myself. Yeah. You know? yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right, Okreen, well, uh, congratulations for qualifying. Do you have any final words that you just want to throw out there before we send you off and get you ready for uh, regionals next month? I do. It, finally, it's my time to thank my practice partners. So, you know, thanks a lot to Laughing, who's been not only for this one, but just in general, always like supporting me, uh, helping with lineup picks, helping with uh, playtesting, helping with freeze mage, and also a big, big thanks to my team. They make it really easy for me to compete in these like sort of things. Just like super, super great team complexity. So yeah, thanks a lot to those guys. And my practice group, JJ, Radu. Yeah, and there were a lot of other guys. But uh, yeah, just thanks to all of them. Yeah, absolutely. It's a team effort. Congratulations, Crane. You're the first person to go to the spring championships later next month. And I hope uh, you the best of luck and the best of preparations for the upcoming tournament. Thanks. All right. And with that... I love to turn the camera, but I think a person actually took a break. I'm just gonna put a huge check mark here. Whoop. You know what? I'm giving myself another check mark. Heck yeah. Crane is the first player out of eight to make it to the spring championships next month. And with that, seven more will be joining. So make sure to get out there on our social media and hashtag HCT. Congratulate Crane on his victory. But don't go anywhere. We're going to go in straight into a second match, which is between Loyan and You Know WP, an upcomer versus a player that's been uh, under radar for a while. How will Loyan be able to handle the pressure? We'll find out right after this.